Hello, I'm Barry Shore, Professor Emeritus at the University of New Hampshire and Head of Content Development here at SSGI. Processes are routinely exposed to change. Technologies change, user and customer preferences change, competition changes, opportunities emerge, and sometimes processes simply need change because they are wasteful or inefficient. This short guide focuses on several of the most important concepts and tools to improve process performance. Before we begin, it is helpful to think of a process as a system. Very simply, a system includes inputs, a process, and outputs. In systems thinking, we focus on the whole rather than its parts. So we look at assembly as a process or an emergency department at a hospital as a process. This systems view helps to emphasize the interconnectedness of every part to that whole and how they combine to deliver customer, end user, or patient value. Process improvement initiatives are projects, and these projects are more likely to succeed if a structured approach is followed. There are two. The first is the traditional approach to project management, also called waterfall. It assumes that not only can project steps be scheduled in advance of the project, but the schedule can be followed with some degree of certainty. The sequence of phases followed using this approach is initiation, planning, executing, monitoring and controlling, and finally closing. The second and increasingly common approach is called Scrum. One of the reasons it has become so common is that it does not assume that every step in a project can be planned. Further, it assumes that we know what we want, but are not quite sure about the steps necessary to get there. As a result, it is a more adaptive approach than waterfall. And in today's complex and uncertain environment, it makes sense that a more adaptive approach is followed. Scrum begins with user stories that define the product. It then breaks these stories into a product backlog and schedules these backlog items in sprints. Before each daily sprint begins, teams meet to discuss what they have accomplished yesterday, what they plan to accomplish today, and the problems that are likely to be encountered. These daily Scrum meetings are at the very core of Scrum. Where do we find the right opportunities for improving process performance? In which functional areas do we commonly waste resources or suffer from avoidable inefficiencies? Well, there are many places to look. Lean professionals have identified eight problem areas that help us answer these questions. Here is where they suggest we look. Excess and costly transportation, inventory levels that are too high, unnecessary motion of staff or customers, waiting, over-processing, over-production, defects, and the failure to benefit from the human resources available in the organization. While these are certainly not the only areas in which waste can be found, and efficiencies improved, they are suggestions often worth exploring. To improve a process, measurements are necessary. So before an improvement project can begin, it is necessary to reflect on the project's goals and identify the metrics that will measure the current and future state of process performance. Often these metrics are referred to as key performance indicators, or KPIs. Not only do these metrics help define a process, but once the process is improved, they are necessary to determine if the project has met its goals, and then to monitor and control a process to ensure that its output continues to meet goals and expectations over time. Here's an important point. Without data, it is difficult to know where you have been, where you are going, or how you are doing once you get there. 
A helpful and visually convincing step is to present the data in chart form. Three types of charts are common. They include bar charts, Pareto charts, and fishbone diagrams. Here is a bar chart. It identifies the categories into which problems are placed on the X or horizontal axis and the frequency of occurrence within these categories on the Y or vertical axis. Process mapping captures the flow of individuals or parts through a process. It is perhaps one of the most important steps in process improvement because it helps us understand the sequence of activities that are followed and their contribution to the overall goals and objectives of the system. Moreover, when a process map is drawn, not only can the source of the problem be more easily localized, but viewing the system as a whole helps to ensure that the root cause of the problem has been uncovered, not just its symptoms. A simple order processing system is shown below. Orders are approved, credit is checked, the order is assembled, and finally the order is packed and shipped. In this oversimplified value stream map, we can see that process steps are represented by rectangles while delays are represented by a shape like the letter D. These delays are identified in this map and are likely to be considered for further analysis with the expectation that they can be either minimized or eliminated. When we identify a problem, it is important to confirm that we have identified the real problem, not just its symptoms. Accordingly, we often engage in root cause analysis. Perhaps the most dramatic example is a patient presenting with chest pains, diagnosed as indigestion, sent home, and hours later succumbing to a heart attack. Here we summarize the core principles of root cause analysis. They include the discipline necessary to avoid stopping at symptoms, the awareness that there may be multiple root causes, refraining from blaming a person, the importance of uncovering concrete evidence to support findings, determining what action needs to be taken, and determining how to prevent problems like this from recurring. Ensuring that processes meet expectations over time requires that output be monitored. In most situations, it is not feasible to monitor every unit of output. It can be very costly. Instead, a sample is taken, and the sample results are used to make inferences about the population. The most common example is political polling for a presidential election, where a sample of 2,000 or fewer potential voters is taken, and from this sample, an estimate is made about the voting preferences of more than a million people. Yes. There is some uncertainty in this estimate, but it is remarkable how close sample results can be to the true but unknown population value. When monitoring and controlling processes, a single sample is taken. The mean of that sample is calculated and plotted on a chart called a quality control chart. It includes a center line, which is called the target and represents the expected average or mean result of the process. Sample means, however, are expected to vary from one sample to the next, even when the process is stable and in control. For example, sample 25 men from a large population, record their weight, and then sample another 25 men. The average weight for each of these samples will vary. This variation in sample means is true for every process. Since sample means vary, we would expect that when we plot sample results on a control chart, it will not be a perfect estimate of the process mean, but it will be close. Here is an example of a control chart. As long as these sample means are reasonably close to the target line and vary randomly about it, 
we can say that the process is in control. But there is more. An upper and lower control limit is also drawn on the chart. Now we have some help in determining whether the process is in control. As long as the sample means fall within the upper and lower control limits, we say that the process is in control. When a sample mean falls outside these limits, we need to look behind this result. Perhaps the mean of the process has shifted, which suggests that the process owner must take remedial action. The goal of every process improvement specialist is to achieve as high a quality outcome as possible. Often, we hear of a Six Sigma standard. Briefly, it is a quality level ensuring that no more than 3.4 defects are incurred per million outcomes, where defects per million outcomes is often abbreviated as DPMO. So a restaurant that achieves a Six Sigma standard of performance would serve no more than 3.4 unacceptable meals per 1 million meals served. Clearly, achieving this very high level of quality might be more reasonable for some products and processes, but not for others. It might be more reasonable to set a five sigma standard where no more than 230 defects per million outcomes would be expected, or even a four sigma standard where 6,210 defects per million outcomes would be expected. Six sigma is a tough standard to achieve. We expect it from a nuclear power plant or an aircraft manufacturer, but the standard may be too high for restaurants and clothing manufacturers. Rather than waiting for problems to occur, the process improvement specialist needs to be proactive and think about what could go wrong. Two approaches are used. The first is called failure mode and effects analysis, or FMEA. It involves a process review session held specifically to anticipate what could go wrong once potential problems are identified, the necessary changes are made to prevent such an occurrence. The second approach is called poke ayoke, in which every effort is made to mistake-proof a product, service, or process. Examples include leak-proof water bottles, treadmills that prevent small children from being caught in the belt, and marking surgical sites to prevent wrong side surgeries. At the beginning of this guide, the comment was made that processes are routinely exposed to change. To shield an organization from what Schumpeter called creative destruction, the philosophy of continuous improvement must become part of a process improvement culture. Otherwise, market share can be lost to competitors whose improved or innovative products, services, and processes eventually displace the organization's current offerings. Here is a table summarizing common stages in a continuous improvement culture. First is the constant effort to be on the lookout for opportunities. Second is the reliance on rigorous and quantifiable benchmarks to define the goal of the improvement project. These benchmarks might be determined internally or may reflect the practices of competitors. Third is the identification of alternative possibilities. Fourth is a formal huddle with stakeholders to determine the alternative that should be chosen. Fifth is the implementation of the solution. The theory of constraints is an approach that helps process improvement specialists recognize and overcome the constraints that interfere with the achievement of project goals. It is a theory that was created by Eliyahu Goldratt, a physicist who later turned to business consulting. His theory was presented in rather an unusual way through a novel titled The Goal, A Process of Ongoing Improvement. 
It took the reader through a process improvement project and highlighted five steps that have been found to be useful in overcoming obstacles to project success. That's it. You should now have a basic understanding of the role taken by a process improvement specialist and the skills and concepts needed to deliver results. And if you have found the material in this guide interesting and useful, you might consider moving on towards certification. As a certified process improvement specialist, you are qualified to lead process improvement projects and contribute in a significant way to the competitive goals of your organization. How difficult will it be? While there is more material in a certification course and it is covered in greater depth, you should find it no more difficult than the material in this guide. How long will it take? In general, if you plan on setting aside two hours every weekday night, it should take about one month. It would take longer, of course, if you can only work during the weekend. So consider making this professional investment in yourself and earning certification in one of the fastest growing areas in business. In addition to a certification course in process improvement, SSGI offers a wide range of courses in process management and leadership. Click below for more information. Once again, I am Barry Shore, and I hope you have enjoyed this presentation.